everybody, welcome back to my channel and thank you for joining me for another true crime deep dive. I do have a lot of videos planned for this month and most of them are going to be coffee and crime times, but I had to fit in one more deep dive because I've been thinking about this case um, since I read the book written by the mother of Christy Marceau a few months back. It's really been on my mind. This case will upset you, it will frustrate you, and it will make you angry. And as we go over the mind-bending circumstances, the absolutely almost unbelievable circumstances of what happened to this young woman, who did everything right, who took the right avenues and sought help from the right people, you will see that in the end, the system that was supposed to protect her, that was supposed to keep her safe, that's what they're there for, like it's their one job, keep her safe so that she could go on and live her best life and fulfill her dreams, it not only let her down, but it played, in my opinion, an enormous role in Christy Marceau's life being taken away from her far, far too soon. Because, say it with me now, the justice system is broken and it really needs to be fixed, not just in the United States, because I know a lot of y'all in the comments are like, oh, this would only happen in the U.S. This would never happen where I live. No, mm -mm, no. There's, there's real issues in every country in the world. And this case brings us to Oakland, New Zealand. Now, Oakland is the biggest city in New Zealand. The University of Oakland is the largest university in New Zealand. It's actually a really great place. I'm not talking smack about Oakland. I'm not talking smack about New Zealand. But, you know, we're all in this together. Whether you live in the U.S. or Canada or Australia, the U.K., Africa, we're all in this together. We're all little cogs in the big machine that doesn't care about us at the end of the day. So feeling a little salty, but it is just so frustrating to see this over and over and over again. The system failing people who are just trying to do what they're supposed to do, who are paying their taxes so that the system is there to do what the system is supposed to do. And the system isn't holding up their end of the bargain. But before we dive in to the details, let's have a word from the sponsor of today's video, Native. And I am so excited, okay? <laughs> because Native wanted me to focus on their body wash today. Native has just released their new Build Your Own Pack, and uh, Native body washes, they happen to be my favorite body washes of all time. So this is going to be a treat for me because you all know I love talking, right? And I love talking about things that I love. <laughs> and I've mentioned these body washes every chance I get. I tell everybody that I love them. I'm so excited. Native's body washes, they have everything that I've always looked for in a body wash. They're made with clean ingredients. They lather beautifully like the lather, <laughs> one of my favorite parts, but this lather it doesn't leave your skin feeling dry like a lot of other body washes that lather to this extent because there's none of those nasty sulfates that are usually needed to make the body washes foam up and the smell. Oh my goodness, <laughs> the smell, the scents, they smell amazing. And the scent lasts all day long. And I love that for hours after my shower, not only can I still smell it like on me, but I can still smell it in the air. And it makes my whole bathroom and bedroom smell like some expensive spa. Listen, I know that this is a sponsored video, but no lie on my children's lives. These body washes are my absolute favorite. I love how my skin feels afterwards. So there's no gross residue left over. My skin just feels clean and soft and silky smooth. The native body washes are made with pH balancing ingredients that are clean, safe, and easy to understand. They're sulfate free, they're cruelty free, they're vegan. And now onto my favorite part, how they smell. No matter what scent you choose, it's just gonna smell good. Maybe you're trying to smell, you know, luxurious, sensual. For that special someone, you're gonna light some candles. You're gonna pour that wine. It's going down for real. You know what I'm talking about. I suggest lathering up with Midnight Jasmine and Sage. There's actually a romance novel called The Scent of Jasmine because it's sensual AF. Add in that sage, you're gonna be unstoppable. But maybe you just wanna smell clean and fresh. You know, you wanna hold on to that just showered feeling all day. Well, then might I suggest Surf and Sea Moss, which smells smells citrusy and clean and bright. Oh my God, I love this smell. It's not just a summer smell for me. I'm using it all year. Or maybe you're going for like a hybrid scent, you know, sexy yet simple. Well then, let me introduce you to my good friend, Key Lime and Sugar, because everyone knows 
there's nothing hotter than a dessert, but for real, I love a good key lime pie, a real key lime pie, the white ones, not the green ones. And this body wash smells exactly like an actual key lime pie. It's kind of unbelievable. You hold yourself to a high standard. And you should also hold your personal care products to a high standard. So take good care of yourself and integrate native body washes into your self-care. You will not regret it. It will probably change your life. I know it sounds dramatic, but it it changed mine. Like, I'm not over-exaggerating. Body wash used to be a very stressful thing for me. I have sensitive skin. It gets dried out really easy. I was always looking to find the right one, um, finding one that, you know, had it all from the smell to the feel. It was a struggle, but no more. I will never use any other body wash but native body washes. So three body washes are normally $24, but if you use my link and use my code STEPHANIEH12, you will get them for $14. That's 40% off. It's a really great deal. Like, (laughs) it's a really great deal. I am going to go and buy a ton of native body washes and use my own damn code. And don't forget, native has so much more to offer from sunscreen to deodorant to, to toothpaste. I use all of them. I use the sunscreen, the face, and the body one every time I go out to the pool. Amazing. Don't forget to click the link in the description, use my code, get you some Native body washes. Thank you so much to Native for sponsoring this video and making the holy grail of body washes. And let's dive right in. Christy Alexis Leslie Marceau was born on April 16, 1993 at 1242 in the afternoon. Her mother, Tracy, was two weeks overdue with Christy when she showed up at National Women's Hospital in Oakland. And baby Christy's slow arrival into the world would be the first sign that she was going to live her life on her terms and at her own pace. But Christy had been a miracle, a baby that her parents Tracy and Brian had thought would never happen, so they didn't mind waiting. Brian Marceau, Christy's father, worked as an avionics mechanic in the Royal New Zealand Air Force, and he met Tracy, his wife, and Christy's mother in 1984. They got married the next year, and in 1987, they welcomed their first child to the world, a daughter named Heather. Soon after Heather was born, Tracy and Brian tried to get pregnant again, wanting Heather to have a sibling and a playmate. But this time around, it was much more difficult, and Tracy had to undergo several invasive fertility procedures before finally giving birth to Christy six years later. In the book that Tracy Marceau wrote about her daughter, she says, quote, When she finally arrived, she was the most beautiful, perfect little being. I was absolutely exhausted, but Brian, the proud and beaming dad, just picked our little princess up and cradled her. I'll never forget the huge grin on his face. Those initial minutes of bonding as parents and child are so important, and it is a memory that we will always hold close. When Brian finally let me hold Christy, I just sat there and gazed at her. She was so beautiful, so precious, and so tiny, and I knew that whatever happened, we would always protect her." End quote. The Marceaus finally had their perfect family, two cute, blue-eyed, blonde girls who would become best friends despite the age gap and their personality differences. Heather was proud to be a big sister, and she helped her mother care for the baby while Brian was out of the country for work. So Brian worked in Australia a lot, and he would only come home when he wasn't working. When Christy was just a few weeks old, she became extremely ill, and the doctors diagnosed her as having a dangerous flesh-eating bacteria that was causing sheets of her little baby skin to come off. The doctors could not figure out how to make her better, and when the bacteria reached baby Christie's nasal passages and began making its way to her brain, the doctors tried a strong concoction of medication and antibiotics, which thankfully ended up working. Christy got better, and her parents breathed a sigh of relief that the world would not be so cruel as to send them a blessing and then steal it away. At that time, they had no idea that the world could be that cruel and would be that cruel. 18 years later. Christy Marceau was the boss of her household from the moment she arrived home. She was forceful, she could be sassy, and she was described as having a natural charm that caused people to gravitate towards her. In her book, Tracy described Christy saying, quote, Christy was a girl who beamed. With her springy little ringlets, dimply cheeks, and exceptionally contagious giggles, she was a pure delight to be around. She was also a very cheeky little cherub, and despite an easygoing nature, was a true Aries, and she could be stubborn. However, it took much to talk her around, and you could never stay cross with her for long. End quote. Christy was apparently the epitome of a people person. She loved socializing even from a very young age. And when she began attending Willow Park School at the age of five, 
She loved it. She made friends very easily, very quickly, and some of these friends would last for the rest of her life. Christy loved to learn. She always wanted to learn more, which caused her to ask a lot of questions constantly and incessantly. And she kept her parents on their toes, not only with the constant question asking and talking, but they eventually realized they could not turn their backs on her because as soon as they did, Christy would get into something, get into trouble, because she loved a good adventure. Christy went on to attend ACG Parnell College, and I believe in New Zealand, college usually means high school or secondary school. So she wasn't actually in college as we know it in like America. It was here that Christy began to really come into her own and show what kind of woman she was, strong, kind, and very concerned for others, especially the underdog or the people who weren't always included, the people who were kind of left on the outside. Tracy tells a story of how Christy illustrated her kindness, saying, quote, One particular day she was outside having lunch and noticed a young boy standing by himself. Christy decided this needed investigating and went to talk to him. He told her he had no friends, and Christy decided that perhaps he was a bit shy. She then took over and found a group of students from his year. She stayed with him until he was comfortable in the group and made sure he was accepted. We knew nothing about this until a card was sent to us from the school. The boy's mother had phoned to ask them to thank Christy for her kindness. He had been so unhappy that they had considered removing him from the school. Christy's good deed had completely turned him around. He had made friends and had settled down. I will always be so proud of her for what she did, end quote. So not only did Christy do this really nice thing, but she didn't even go home and brag to her parents about it. And it is a really nice thing because school's hard. Kids are cruel. It's even harder when you don't have any friends to, like, ally with. So what Christy did is she gave this, this kid a really big gift, and I can only hope that when my kids are in school, if they're feeling a little bit left out, if they're feeling a little bit on the outside, that someone like Christy comes along and gives them a hand just out of the kindness of their heart. Christy became more and more aware as she grew up that many people were not as fortunate as her, not just in you know financial terms, but as far as like family and friends and personality goes. And so she became very involved in social issues and charitable causes. In her last year at ACG Parnell, Christy organized the 40-year famine appeal at her school. She even convinced a television station to record the fundraiser in order to raise awareness and bring more attention to it. And her favorite charity was SAFE, which stands for Save Animals from Exploitation. Christy had no natural sports abilities. Um, she, she wasn't like super athletic, but she still enjoyed being active and participating in team sports, mostly for the social aspect. She was a member of the North Shore United Women's Hockey Team. She joined the North Shore Swimming Club, but she really did this just to stay social and, you know, be around other people her own age. But her coach of the hockey team, he did say like, Christy was so nice, she would literally not hurt a fly. When Christy was 14, her older sister Heather, who was then 20 years old, moved out of the family home, and Christy began to refer to herself as the lonely child instead of the only child because she missed her sister so much. They were really close. Where Christy was outgoing and bubbly, Heather was the quiet, serious type. But what they did share was an incredible love for each other, and they also shared the desire to protect each other at all costs. Christy and her mother Tracy were also very close. Tracy said Christy was a loving and affectionate daughter, even in her teenage years. And Christy would always make sure to pop her head into Tracy's bedroom to say goodnight and to say I love you before turning in for the evening. Tracy and Christy did a lot together. They went out to eat together. They went shopping together. They worked out at the gym together, even though Tracy said that Christy did more like slow walking on the treadmill while texting her friends than actually running and exercising. But Christy had an explanation for that. She called it texture sizing. She also said that her her room had a floor drobe instead of a wardrobe because Christy's mother Tracy said that her clothes were like always all over the place, like laying on the floor. And Christy was like, yeah, I know where they are. I put them there on the floor. It's only when you come in here and pick up my room that I don't know where to find my clothes. At night, Christy and her mother would watch movies together, usually like funny comedy movies that Christy liked, and they would talk about whatever was on their minds. After secondary school, Christy enrolled at the Oakland University of Technology to study event management. Her dream was to have her own events planning business by the time she was 30. And everyone who knew her thought it was the perfect career path for Christy since she was so outgoing, she could talk to anybody about anything, and she easily put people at ease. 
Christy was also a great friend to everyone and anyone. Her parents said that their home was always filled with young people, some they knew, some they didn't, because Christy would make friends so easily. Now, one of these new acquaintances, somebody that she took under her wing, sort of, was a young man named Akshay Chand. And he, like so many others, felt comfortable talking to Christy. She made him feel he could be vulnerable and open with her, even though he was not someone who naturally felt comfortable talking to girls at all. In fact, I believe he said that Christy was the one girl he felt comfortable talking to. Akshay Chand was born on November 11, 1992 in Fiji, an island country in the South Pacific. Chand came from a family with complicated dynamics. When he was four, he and his parents and newborn sister moved to the UK from Fiji, where they would live for four years while Akshay's father, Anand, pursued a degree in sociology. When Akshay was eight, the family moved once again to Wales, where his father had been offered a job. Later, Akshay would remember his time in Wales as the best of his life, but it was also the shortest time period of his life. They would only be in Wales for about a year before the family moved again, this time to Auckland, New Zealand. However, it was only Akshay, his mother Suchita, and his little sister Shael who settled in Auckland. Akshay's father Anand stayed in Wales to finish his studies and his work, and the original plan was that he would rejoin his family a year later, but this never happened. Anand and Suchita would go on to separate. Anand moved back to Fiji, where he became a sociology professor at the University of the South Pacific. And it was almost as if he forgot he had a family at all, which of course was hard on Akshay and his sister. And Akshay's mother said that sometimes Anand, Akshay's father, would call and, you know, kind of want to talk to Akshay, but Akshay didn't want to talk to him. When Akshay was 10, he attended Willow Park School, the same school that Christy attended. Akshay also lived in an upstairs apartment in Hillcrest. This is exactly where Christy lived, Hillcrest, and he actually lived less than a mile away from Christy's family home. During the two years that Akshay and Christy attended Willow Park together, they knew of each other, but they weren't friends. After primary school, the two children went their separate ways, and Akshay attended Northcote College, where he was described as an incredibly bright and gifted student who excelled in English and math. His teacher said he was clever, courteous, and he had boatloads of potential. Like, this kid was wicked smart, so everyone was surprised when Akshay began to change, probably when he was about 16, because he was in year 11, so I believe year 11 coincides with... 16. He barely passed his 12th year, and he outright failed his 13th year. And eventually, he just dropped out of school. He stopped going. Before this, Akshay had been friendly with some kids his age. Not a lot. You know, he had never had a large group of friends, but he had a couple close friends who would come over, and they hung out and talked and played video games. But Akshay eventually withdrew from everyone until he had no social life at all. He did have two friends who he had been close to for some time, and when they talked to the police— one of them said, quote, he was a smart guy. I have never seen him act aggressively or be angry at anyone. I've never heard him speak about girls or girlfriends. He talks about video games a lot. He was afraid of the cost of driving, so he never got into cars or drove. I always got a lonely sense from Akshay, like he was not fulfilled. He never saw his dad. He was always rude and disrespectful to his mom. He was always really short with her when he talked to her, end quote. The other friend said that whenever he was at Akshay's house, they usually played video games, and Akshay was also a good soccer player. Some of his peers felt Akshay was quiet, ordinary, you know, nothing um, stood out about him, and he kept to himself. Others described him as creepy and strange. A girl who had attended high school with him said, quote, He was always really shy and polite, I thought. I recently talked to an old friend who claims he used to snap and get really angry at small things, but I never saw that side of him. We weren't particularly close. He was just always really quiet. I thought he was very mild. He seemed nice when you finally got him to speak, and his close friends spoke very highly of him. He didn't have many friends. There was a small group of them. I think it was because he's shy, but it could have been something more. End quote. As his mental state got worse, Akshay's weight, it fluctuated, went up and down. He began to lose interest in things he had once enjoyed doing. He was also having trouble sleeping, and this threw his whole schedule off. After leaving school, Akshay would stay up all night, surfing the web, playing video games, or playing chess online, and then he would sleep all day. Akshay would stay in his room night and day, listening to music and reading a book written by Karl Marx called Das Kapital, which is basically just talking about how capitalism is bad and the root of all evil, etc. You know, the stuff that communists like Karl Marx 
were always talking about and what they stood for. Apparently, Akshay Chand hated capitalism and he blamed it for everything. He blamed it for his family falling apart. He just thought it was the root of all evil. His mother, who was very busy working as a nurse to try and make sure her children had what they needed, she became increasingly frustrated by her once promising son's quick downturn. He didn't have a job. He didn't want to get a job. He wasn't going to school. He didn't want to go back to school. He would barely ever leave his room. So she asked her sister and Akshay's aunt for help. And Akshay's aunt got him a job at the local countdown supermarket, where he worked behind the meat counter. Of course, Akshay felt that this job was beneath him because he was so smart and superior to the people working beside him who were just going through their 9-to-5 grind like sheep. There was a bright spot, though, to this boring, menial job. Akshay was able to reconnect with someone from his past, a blue-eyed, bubbly girl named Christy Marceau who worked at the checkout lanes at the same supermarket. When Akshay and Christy's paths crossed again, he not only had never had a girlfriend, but he found it very difficult to even carry on a conversation with a female. But with Christy, it was different. She listened when he talked about how depressed he was. She seemed to genuinely care. She offered him advice and support. She even invited him over to her home to talk more after work. But it didn't take long before Christy realized that as much as she wanted to help Akshay, as much as she did genuinely care, he didn't seem to really want to help himself. And he never took her advice or sought out mental health help. Christy did admittedly have a soft spot for the underdog, the person who was on the outside looking in, but even she had her limits. And when Akshay began turning up at her house uninvited, sometimes staying long after Christy and her family had sent subtle signals that it was time to go, she decided things had gotten a bit too familiar and maybe Akshay had fixated on her a little. He seemed to be obsessed with Christy and very dependent on her. In June of 2011, Christy quit her job at the supermarket and began working at a local cheese shop. The same day she quit, Akshay also left his supermarket job, feeling that since Christy was no longer employed there, he had no reason to be there either. In 2012, Christy was finishing up her first year at university, and since leaving the supermarket, she had put some distance between herself and Akshay, and some of this distance was natural because they weren't working together every day anymore, so it just kind of was this natural spacing. Christy was very busy with school and work. She was also getting ready for a big move. As I talked about previously, Christy's father, Brian, he worked a good deal of the year in Australia, and he would fly back to Oakland on his days off to be with his family. But since they were all so close, the distance had been tough. Like, this family liked to do everything together. They liked to be together. They enjoyed each other's company. So Christy and her mother, Tracy, were planning to move to Adelaide in early 2013 to be closer to him. Christy was looking forward to transferring to an Australian university, having a new city to explore, having new adventures in a new country. So there was a lot going on in her life, and she just no longer had the time or the inclination to entertain the rantings of a troubled young man who had no desire to actually change his circumstances. He seemed to only want to complain about them and use them to get sympathy and attention. And listen, I'm not cold-hearted or anything. Christy's not cold-hearted or anything. I'm sure we all know at least one person like this, right? They always have the same problems. They're the people that um, post about how much they hate their boyfriends or girlfriends on Facebook. Or they're the people who post on Facebook like, going through so much right now. Life is just hopeless. I don't know if I can continue doing this. And so you message them and you're like, what's going on? And they're like, I don't want to talk about it. Well, well, why'd you post it on Facebook then? Did you know that people can see what you're posting on Facebook? Like it's public, you know? So we all know at least one person like this. Don't judge me. Christy and Akshay had not spoken in months when she got a call from him on the morning of September 6, 2011. It was a Tuesday morning and Christy was still sleeping when the house phone rang at around 10 a.m. and this woke her up. But before she could reach the phone, the ringing had stopped. So she started walking away and then the phone directly afterwards began ringing again and so Christy answered it. It was Akshay Chand. He told her that he had crushed up 40 pills and placed them into a drink. And if she didn't get to his house within 10 minutes, he was going to drink it all. Christy had pulled away from Akshay because he had started to behave inappropriately. Christy's mother Tracy remembered one day she and Christy had returned home after dropping Brian off at the airport to find Akshay sitting on their front steps. And he did this a lot. He would show up unannounced and then not leave. 
He'd also sent Christy a letter after he found out she would be moving to Australia. And in this letter, he confessed that he was in love with her. And he was very upset that she was moving away from Oakland and leaving him. Another time, Akshay had given Christy a large sum of money. And she told him, I can't take this. Like, it's too much. I don't want to take your money. But he insisted over and over again to the point where she did take the money. But she didn't spend it. She set it aside in a safe place kind of knowing that he would be asking for it back, which he did a few days later. Akshay had also followed Christy home from a work party one night when he'd been drunk. He had to end up crashing in their spare bedroom because he was like so drunk and raving and ranting that they just couldn't send him home. But even though all of this had happened, Christy Marceau was not the type of person who would ignore a cry for help if somebody's life was in danger. And to be fair, you know, she suspected that Akshay may have been a bit hung up on her, but she wasn't afraid of him. She didn't think that he would hurt her. She didn't think that yet, at least. A lot of the following will be in Christie's own words, taken from a transcript of her police interview after the fact. So she gets this call from Akshay. He's like, get here in 10 minutes or I'm going to basically take my own life. So she hurriedly threw a pair of track pants and a sweatshirt over her underwear and bra that she'd slept in. She jumped in her car and drove the very short distance to Akshay's apartment. And if Christy had decided to walk to his place, it would have been even quicker since the street Akshay lived on was almost parallel to the street Christy lived on. All she would have had to do was cut through some lawns. I think there was like a gully or something, and then she would have been there. It's important to understand the distance between their two homes was very small. When Christy arrived at Akshay's apartment, she parked on the street, she knocked on the door, and Akshay answered it and invited her inside. His mother was at work and his 16-year-old sister was at school. But what Christy did not know is that when he opened the door for her and told her to come in, Akshay had a 20-centimeter long kitchen knife hidden in the waistband of his pants. Christy later told the police, quote, When I got there, I asked him where the drink was because I saw some white powder on his kitchen bench. I asked him where the drink was, and he said to me, Do you think I am stupid? I obviously hid it because I knew that you'd find it. Then he was talking to me about how he was planning, how he had some aims of his task. I told him that I thought he needed to get help because he hasn't been very well. He was talking to me about how I wasn't there and that I could have tried, but I said, I've been really busy with uni and work. He said even five minutes on Facebook would have been enough, and I said that I didn't have much time for the computer. He shook his head and he said, let's face it, we both know that you haven't been very busy, end quote. Akshay grilled Christy about why she'd left him high and dry. According to him, she left him high and dry, why she hadn't been there for him. He told her he didn't need professional help. He wanted her to be his full-time counselor. And then he told her that he had cervical cancer. <laughs> when Christy told him that he couldn't have cervical cancer because he wasn't in possession of a cervix, Akshay got frustrated and claimed, no, it wasn't cervical cancer, he had prostate cancer. Christy was not super happy with this turn of events because she'd had family members who had battled with cancer, and she didn't believe it was something to joke about, lie about, or use for attention. And she told him as much. Christy told the police, quote, that was when he got really angry, and then he pulled a knife out of his back pocket. He got up and stood over me. His right hand was shaking it as he was waving it. It was a kitchen knife, like one of those ones that you pull out of a knife set. It was about 20 centimeters, and it looked like he'd sharpened it. It was a really sudden movement. He just pulls it out, and he's holding it, and in an instant, he was standing over me. He just held it with his fist clenched. He said, this is how it's going to go. If you scream, I'm going to knife you. When he said that to me, I started crying because I thought he was going to kill me. I've never been so terrified in my life. Then he told me to shut up and compose myself. I wanted to text my friend because I wanted someone to help me. So I had my phone in my hand and he got up and had the knife in his right hand and he was standing there with his left hand in front of my face and he was saying, give me your phone. He grabbed it out of my hand. I didn't want to give him my phone. He was saying, we can either do this the hard way or the easy way. He said, you'll know what you get if you don't give it to me, end quote. Akshay had already told Christy he had certain goals for that day. Three things specifically that he wanted to accomplish. First, he wanted to scare her. Second, he wanted to get his revenge on her. And third, he wanted to take his own life. Christy must have been truly terrified because Akshay's to-do list, it was sort of vague. And she had no idea how he would go about scaring her or getting his revenge. But within moments, Akshay made it clear how he was going to do both. He instructed her to take off her clothes. Christy told the police, quote, 
He told me to take off my jumper, and I had to throw it to him. He checked all the pockets. Then he told me to take my shirt off, and I said I wouldn't do it. He said, you know what will happen if you don't do it. So I had to take it off, and I had to throw it to him. I had to stand up and show him that I didn't have anything in my pockets in my pants. Then he said, now take your pants off. I said, no, I won't do it. It's too far. I can't do it. I started crying more because by then I was getting an idea of what he wanted to do, and I told him that I wouldn't do it. He held the knife out, and he said, you know what will happen. So I took them off, and I did throw them to him as well. He put all my clothes in a pile, and then he started talking. He was sitting on the armchair, and he had the knife in his hand, and every so often he'd twirl it in his fingers, and then he'd look at his fingers, and he'd be like, ouch, like he cut himself. Because he's so much bigger than me, I knew that I couldn't overpower him. But at one point, I thought about just telling him to knife me because I wanted to get out. I've never been so terrified in my life. I thought that looking around the room, that this would be the last thing that I was going to see before I die. And nobody even knew where I was. And then I thought about going to run to the door, but he'd locked the door. And if I got stuck at the door, he would have knifed me, probably tried to kill me. So I never felt like I could leave. I felt like I was stuck on that couch and the only way I could leave the couch was if he told me I could go. I thought he was just going to stab me once, maybe in my arm or leg, and I thought that if he stabbed me once, he could probably do it multiple times. I was just trying to appease everything he was saying. I remember from watching Criminal Minds and stuff, a hostile person, you have to appease what they want and make it seem like it was you. So I was saying, no, it was me. I was selfish. I could have prevented this. I was trying to talk him around because I just wanted to get out of there, end quote. As Christy sat there wearing only her underwear, Akshay began to rant and rave. He said that he was sure he had been taken by the devil, who'd been trying to get him for years. He was now fighting against the devil inside of him, but he was losing. He ranted about capitalism, using big words and terms and then demanding Christy tell him what they meant. He told Christy she was the kind of person who hurt others, who made others suffer. He verbally berated her and flew from topic to topic before telling Christy that her effort in showing up that day had been too little too late. He told her to imagine that they were both in a fishing boat, but he'd fallen out. He told her to then imagine that she sat there in the boat and watched him struggle in the water, only pulling him out and saving his life just before he was about to drown. He told her, quote, That is what you're doing right now. When I needed help, you were too busy. And then when I finally make this desperate call to you, you're here, end quote. After this explanation of why Akshay was so offended, Christy could only ask one thing. She wanted to know if he was going to kill her. Is that how he would be seeking his revenge? Akshay did not say he wasn't going to kill her. He simply said that his plan was to rape her, at which point Christy began sobbing uncontrollably, tears of fear spilling out of her eyes as she sat exposed and vulnerable in front of a ranting maniac who was holding a knife. Christy later told the police, quote, I thought if I cried out loud enough, the neighbors in the next house would hear me because the whole time I was there, I could hear them talking. I just wanted someone to hear me because I could hear people outside. He told me that if I didn't compose myself, it would be worse for me. And so I tried. But at the same time, I just wanted to cry louder because I could hear the neighbor and I thought he would be able to hear me and someone would be able to do something, end quote. After telling her to compose herself, Akshay Shand appeared to have a change of heart. He'd been holding onto Christy's clothes, but he tossed them back to her now, along with her cell phone, and he told her she could leave. Christy, who'd been through an ordeal, she was still terrified, and she thought that he was trying to trick her. She imagined that as soon as she turned her back to go to the front door, he would stab her in the back, and she said as much to him. Akshay put the knife down and said, quote, I'm going to let you go, but I just want you to know that once you leave, I'm going to drink the drink I made, end quote. Even after all he had done, this still made Christy pause. And she told him that she didn't want him to do that. She didn't want him to drink the drink and, and hurt himself. It wasn't worth it. He told her, well, I don't care what you want. I'm going to do it anyways. It's my only option because my parents don't love me. So I just want to die. Christy would not try to talk him out of it again. She wasn't going to push her luck. I mean, I give her credit for even trying the first time, because as soon as I had my clothes and my phone and he put the knife down, I would have been out. Like, Christy ran from the apartment. She got into her car. She locked the doors and drove home sobbing. When Christy got home, her mother, Tracy, was at work, but her grandmother, Shirley, was there. Shirley lived in the home with Tracy and Christy. I guess she had her own self-contained flat inside the home. And so Shirley called Tracy at work and told her daughter that Christy had been attacked by a man named Akshay Chand. 
Now, Tracy remembered Akshay. She remembered him as the one who would always show up at her house, and after this had happened a few times, she'd asked Christy to cut off contact with him. It wasn't until after her daughter was dead that Tracy heard stories from neighbors about how Akshay would arrive at the house when no one was home, and he would sit in the driveway for four or five hours until someone got there. Christy had told her mother not to worry too much, that, yeah, he's a lot, you know, he's kind of thirsty, but I feel bad for him, he's going through a lot, and he's not dangerous. At this point, though, both Tracy and Christy realized that they had not taken his actions seriously enough. They had not paid enough attention to the red flags. Tracy left work and drove home, but none of them felt safe in that house because Akshay lived right around the corner, and he'd been in their house enough to know where it was, how to get in, and also to know that Christy's father, Brian, was rarely there. So the three women made the decision to go to the police and report what had happened. Meanwhile, Akshay Chand was not making his way to Christie's house to finish what he had started. He was downing the drink he had prepared with the crushed up pills, which ended up being multivitamins that he'd stolen from his mother. He had read somewhere that if a person took too many multivitamins, it could have a toxic effect on the body. Probably not going to kill you, though. Probably just going to give you, like, organ failure, but okay. When his little sister got home from school, Akshay calmly told her what he had done and asked her to call an ambulance for him. Both Akshay and his sister went with the ambulance to North Shore Hospital, where he was treated and then admitted so he could have a mental health assessment. After Christy told the police what had happened in his apartment, they went there to question him, but they found only his mother was home and she had no idea where Akshay or his sister were. Eventually, the police were able to track Akshay down to the hospital and they went there to question him, at which point he confessed to everything like pretty easily. They were like, did you do this? And he was like, yep. They were like, did you do this? He was like, yep. Everything that Christy had said, they asked him about and he said yes. He responded affirmatively that he had done all of that. Detective James Watson said that Akshay was not at all surprised when the police showed up. It was almost as if he had been expecting them. Akshay had told the nurses and the doctors about his mental health issues and how his parents didn't love him, blah, blah, blah. But he left out the part about holding a woman against her will and threatening to stab and rape her. Akshay told the police that his plan had been to rape Christy, but he'd changed his mind at the last minute. He was arrested and charged with kidnapping, assault with attempt to commit sexual violation, and threatening to do grievous bodily harm. Akshay told the police at the station that even though he had changed his mind about assaulting Christy, he was still very angry with her for abandoning him, and he still wanted revenge. Detective Watson said, quote, At the initial interview, I was pleased that he was basically confessing to us what he had done. When we're looking at charging someone, we have to get certain ingredients. For example, when he told Christy to take off her clothes, we asked him what his intention was, and he admitted he intended to rape her. That clearly widened the charges against him. The charge of assault with intent to rape really came from his admissions, which is good from a prosecutor's point of view. That gave us evidence to go forward and charge him with a view to getting a conviction in court, end quote. Obviously, everyone was very concerned about what had happened. Christy and her mother were terrified that Akshay would attack again, and the police, after hearing from Christy about what had happened and talking to Akshay himself, who claimed he still wanted revenge, they knew it was of the utmost importance to make sure that Akshay stayed in custody while waiting for his trial. Detective Adam Iremonger, who was there when Akshay was arrested, he knew that it was imperative for the police to do all they could to keep Akshay behind bars and to make sure the judge and the court were very aware of how terrified Akshay's victim Christy was and how close her home was to the home of Akshay's mother, where he lived full time. Christy's mother Tracy wrote in her book, quote, I cannot praise the police enough for how they dealt with a traumatized young girl. They were patient, understanding, and so caring in their handling of the situation. They told us that what had occurred was extremely serious and they would make sure we were safe and the offender would be detained. Our fear was so great that we did not return to our house until we received a phone call advising us that he was in police custody, end quote. When Christy had been attacked, she hadn't wanted to tell her father, Brian, because she knew he would get right on a plane and come home, and Christy didn't want to do anything to put his job in jeopardy or to stress him out. Brian did come home the following weekend, and he was horrified when he'd heard what had happened. For several weeks, for several months, Christy Marceau was a shell of the bright and happy young woman she'd once been. She became extremely nervous. She would jump at sounds, and for two weeks she slept in her parents' room. And then she moved to the spare bedroom next to her parents' room because her room was on the ground floor of the house and she just didn't feel safe there. Her mother said she would still wake them up like three or four times a night and say she heard a noise and she wanted them to look into it and see what it was. 
She had her parents drive her to and from school and work since she was too afraid to take public transportation, and she began going to therapy to try and process what had happened to her. The Marceau family waited anxiously because the police had told them that they would do everything in their power to make sure Akshay didn't get bail. But of course, in the end, it's up to the judge. And there was a law in New Zealand called the Bail Act. The Bail Act stated that if the offender had no prior convictions and they were over the age of 17 and under the age of 20, they must be released on bail. Now, Akshay had no prior convictions. He didn't have a criminal record of any kind. He'd never been in trouble with the law before. So... He was a perfect candidate for the Bail Act. The day after the attack, September 7th, Akshay Chand made his first court appearance in front of Judge Barbara Morris, who denied bail and ordered a full mental health evaluation to be done that same day. Judge Morris had requested that Akshay be sent to a mental health unit instead of prison, so he had to be assessed before that could happen. Akshay was interviewed and examined by a forensic nurse named Robin Burt, who concluded that Akshay did not fulfill the Mental Health Act criteria. He was not in need of acute psychiatric administration. Akshay was not expressing an intent to hurt himself or others. He was talking about taking antidepressants. His affect was flat, but he was answering questions articulately and staying on topic. Bert said that Akshay knew what he had done, he knew why he was in prison, and he knew that what he had done was wrong. On September 9th, Akshay was once again in court in front of Judge Barbara Morris, and again he was asking for bail. At this hearing, Judge Morris said, quote, It is a sad case, a difficult case, and of course, Mr. Chand has the presumption of innocence. Chand has seen a doctor in prison and one in custody overnight, and he's been prescribed, although not commenced taking, antidepressant medication. He's also helpfully been seen by the forensic nurse. He's not exhibiting any of the classic symptoms of a mental health issue, end quote. Akshay's lawyer and some of his family members spoke on his behalf. They were hoping to get him released. They said he was going to be taking medication. He would also promise to attend a psychiatric program within a week of his release, and he'd be staying with his mother where he could be watched and monitored at all times. Detective James Watson prepared a document titled Grounds for Opposing Bail, and this document detailed how Akshay had admitted to the kidnapping and his intent to sexually assault Christy. Detective Watson also went in depth about how scared Christy Marceau was and how close Akshay's mother lived to Christy. Him being released and staying at his mother's house, it just was not a viable option. And Judge Morris agreed, saying, quote, This is a difficult matter, but nothing has changed at the moment from when these allegations arose. There is no question that Mr. Chand is certainly depressed. From public safety concerns, however, and the complainant, who is exceedingly fearful, I do not consider it prudent or wise to grant bail until at least a full forensic report can be obtained. In the meantime, Mr. Chand can hopefully commence on the medication." End quote. For the next month, Akshay Chand spoke to several mental health professionals. He told them that he had been suffering with anxiety and depression for five years, but he was not getting support from his family, not for his mental illness or anything at all. He didn't want a relationship with his father, he didn't get along with his mother, and the only person that he actually considered as family was his little sister. On September 20th, he was interviewed by Dr. Ian Goodwin, who had obtained his medical history as well as his family's medical history. Now, it turns out that there was a significant history of mental illness on his father's side. Akshay's father, Adnan Shand, had suffered from severe depression that had started when he was about 40 years old, and he had to take medication to keep it in check. Akshay's grandmother and Adnan's mother had taken her own life when she was just 32, and one of Akshay's cousins had been diagnosed with schizophrenia. Now, Akshay told Dr. Goodwin that he'd been depressed for only about a year instead of four to five years, like he told others, but that was the extent of it. He didn't say that he was having suicidal thoughts. He didn't say that he was thinking about hurting himself or others. At this point, Akshay did not mention anything resembling any psychotic symptoms, such as having visions or hearing voices. That claim would come later after Akshay returned to Christy Marceau's house to exact his revenge. Dr. Goodwin wrote in his report that Akshay displayed symptoms of mild to moderate depression and that he did not fulfill the criteria for a mental disorder. He said Akshay had a good understanding of the charges he was facing and he would be capable of working with his attorneys to build a defense for himself. On October 5th, Akshay was seen by a nurse who said, quote, 
The defendant told me that he feels well and is pleased to be on antidepressant medication. Mood appears to be stable. Today, the defendant denies any risk issues to himself or to others. There is no evidence of thought disorder or disorganization in the defendant's thinking. There are no psychotic features and no concerns from custodial staff." End quote. This same day, Akshay was back in court for another bail hearing, but this time the court would hear two letters, one that Akshay had written and one that his victim, Christy Marceau, had written. And this time, Akshay was not appearing in front of level-headed Barbara Morris. A different judge would hear the details, Judge David McNaughton. In his letter, Akshay said, quote, I am incredibly sorry for the ordeal I put Christy through. I am only remorseful for my actions. I know she will sooner forgive me than I will forgive myself. Given the chance, I will apologize to her, her parents, and anyone else affected. Ironically, the last thing she said to me was that she was sorry. It's only after the events of the day that she realized how much pain depression had caused me and how much I needed her and vice versa. She was my emotional outlet. There was nothing that I couldn't tell her and vice versa. She's really adamant, and I'm sure she feels she's the one to blame. She acknowledges that her absence led to escalation and the impending event that occurred. But as modest as she is, truthfully, the blame is on my shoulders. I take full responsibility for my actions and accept the consequences of my wrongdoings. In my defense, what I did was aided by great psychological pressure. And in your head, you believe that no one cares if you live or die. I was desperate, vulnerable, and exploited my own weakness. I will do everything in my power to get the help I need. I've been on antidepressants, and I'm willing to receive counseling. I wish I had only asked for help earlier. End quote. Okay. <laughs> okay, so this is the biggest sorry not sorry letter I've ever seen written. Akshay is literally saying that Christy contributed to her own attack, even though later he says, oh, no, no, I take all the blame. He literally says she acknowledges her absence led to this escalation. <laughs> Fun fact, I don't know who needs to hear this, but you are not responsible for anyone else's health. Not their mental health, not their physical health, nothing. You are responsible for you. You can want to help, you can try to help, but in the end, it is no one else's job to be there for anyone else. Nobody is entitled to have somebody who has their own life and their own shit going on be there for them. The level of entitlement of people who think this way is truly scary. In my opinion, Christy tried to help him by being there for him. She suggested he get professional help, which clearly he needed. But when she realized that he wasn't going to do this, and it was going to be the same song and dance every time she talked to him, she had to pull back for her own well-being. It's okay to set boundaries with others. It's okay to say enough is enough. It's okay to tell someone, I'm sorry you're going through this, but I don't feel I can help you any longer. Don't let anybody tell you it's not okay for you to do that. But Akshay is basically saying in this letter to the judge, that Christy was at fault because she didn't talk to him enough, because she moved on with her life, focused on taking care of herself. And the judge, McNaughton, he's going to look at this letter and say, yeah, that's valid. Sounds about right to me. <laughs> I, I can't. I can't believe it. It's so infuriating that any judge would look at this letter and see anything but a narcissist and somebody who was mentally ill. Because the only reason that Christy apologized to Akshay, the only reason she said it's my fault, I take responsibility, was because he was holding her at knife point, okay? So it's like these guys, these dirtbags out there who physically threaten women and then sexually assault them. And then later they're like, well, she had sex with me. She had sex with you because you were holding a gun at her or holding a knife at her. She had sex with you because she thought that the only other option was you were going to kill her. That doesn't mean you're sexually appealing. That doesn't mean that women just can't keep their clothes on around you. It means you're a scary psychopath and this person was afraid for their life. So Christy, she's saying like, yes, you're right, I'm bad because she thinks that this is gonna keep him calm. Because if she says to him, no, that's not right. You're crazy, dude. I have my own life to live. You're a grown ass man. I'm not responsible for whatever the hell's going on with you. If she said that to him, he'd probably stab her. So she was just appeasing him. But this dude is so delusional that he actually thinks she meant it. And the judge is going to read this and he's going to say, oh, well, you know, these two kids must have been really close. They were each other's sounding board, you know, because Akshay's like, Christy and I depended on each other. I could go to her with anything and vice versa. So Akshay's really got it in his head that he meant something to her beyond 
just her being a nice person. The police officers, the detectives on this case, they said this to the judge. The, everything that I said pretty much, you know, not not as aggressively or angrily, but they were like, listen, Akshay attacked Christy because he wanted revenge on her. He was going to rape her for revenge. And when we arrested him and talked to him at the police station, he said that he still wanted revenge. Not to mention Christy and Akshay live like five minutes apart, walking distance. So Christy wrote a list of reasons why she believed her attacker should not be granted bail along with her letter. The list had several bullet points. She said that, you know, their houses were so close. She said if he was out on bail, she would be fearful to live in her own home. She said Akshay knew where she lived. He could easily show up whenever. She wanted to know, how is he going to be monitored? Like if he goes home on bail and you're saying he's monitored, 24 7. How is that going to happen? How will you guys know if he's home or not? In this list, she also said, quote, if he's treating this like a game, he could come after me and do it again, as he has nothing to lose and has been sitting in custody thinking of ways to get revenge, end quote. Exactly. Exactly. This is something that Christy knew. This is something the police knew, but apparently not something that the judge knew or understood or gave a shit about. Now, Christy's letter said, quote, I wish to oppose Akshay receiving bail, as the events have made me wary of his intentions. I worry for my safety because of this, and particularly as my father is currently on a job in Australia, which reduces the support I can rely on. Akshay's family, mother and auntie, live close to my home, so I feel that he may play on my thoughts as he knows my father is away. He also knows my routine, traveling to uni and where I work in the city. I am worried that he may still try to get revenge on me, as he is already in trouble and has nothing to lose if he tries again. This causes me to worry for my safety. I catch the bus to uni or work every day, so I am worried that living close by, he would be able to follow me and get on the bus. I also have exams for university coming up and wish to be able to concentrate on my studies and not have to constantly have this on my mind, that he is out and has the possibility of getting me again. I would like to get on with my life, but at present I need to know that I don't have to encounter him as I try to restore my faith in people. This has caused me a lot of distrust." End quote. So I think we can all agree, someone who would lure a young woman to his house, hold her at knife point, force her to undress in front of him while threatening to stab her and then telling her he's planning to rape her, probably not someone any of us would like wandering about on the streets, much less if we were in Christie's shoes, if we were the ones who'd been trapped for an hour, fearing for our lives the entire time, sitting in front of an armed madman, ranting about capitalism and God and the devil. And even if Akshay didn't live right around the corner from Christie, he still should have been held in custody until his trial. But for some reason, Judge McNaughton did not agree, and he granted bail to Akshay Chand with some conditions. Akshay would be living at his mother's house, only being allowed to leave if he had an appointment with his lawyer or doctor. If he did have to leave for an appointment, he needed to be accompanied by his mother or his aunt. Akshay was also forbidden from having any contact with Christy or her family, and he could not go anywhere near Christy's house. In her book, Christy's mother, Tracy Marceau, said, quote, When the conditions of bail were explained to me, I completely lost the plot. He was to be bailed to his mother's house with a 24-hour curfew. His mother lived a 350-meter walk from our house, and we could see their house from our deck, so we were sure that they would be able to see our house too. His mother worked, and as far as we know, there would be no one to make sure he didn't leave the house while she was not there. I was crying as I pleaded with the registrar to get the judge to reconsider the decision because I just knew Christy was in danger. This was to no avail. The decision had been made and the matter was closed." End quote. Akshay had written in his letter to the judge that he took complete responsibility and he would love the chance to apologize to Christy and her family and whoever else he hurt, but that was not what Akshay did when he walked back into society on October 6th. Akshay laid low for a few weeks knowing that Christy and her family would probably be expecting him to do something, and he didn't want that. He didn't want his victim to be prepared for an attack. He didn't want her to be on the alert. He wanted her to feel safe. He wanted her to feel that even if he was just a stone throw away, he wasn't a danger to her. That way, when he finally did strike, she'd be all the more terrified and she would realize the mistake that she had made by having this false sense of security. Akshay Chand wanted to control. He wanted control that would allow him to strike fear into the hearts of those who saw him. He wanted control that would allow him to choose who lived and who died. So 32 days after Akshay Chand was granted bail, he would show up at Christy Marceau's home and he would finally get his revenge. So that is going to be the end of part one. Um, part two, I won't make you wait long for it. I probably will record part two before I even 
post this just so, you know, they're coming out pretty quickly and, and close to each other. But uh, let me know what you think about this in the comment section. Don't forget to like this video if you liked it, share it if you think it's worth sharing, subscribe to my YouTube channel if you haven't subscribed already. And if you already have subscribed, make sure you still are subscribed because YouTube, uh, they like to unsubscribe people from my channel all the time. And then they like to write letters to the judge and tell them that it was all my fault that they unsubscribe people from my channel. Sounds familiar. Also, don't forget to follow my podcast, Crime Weekly, that I co-host every week with retired police detective Derek Lavasser. New episodes go up on podcast platforms every Friday, and that same episode will be released on our YouTube channel the following Wednesday. All the links are in the description. Thank you guys so much for being here. Stay kind, stay beautiful, stay safe, and I'll see you very soon. Bye. Straight down And that river runs deep The mountains get steep And the voices getting too loud Oh, these feelings are very It's looking like a cemetery They're going back from the grave Calling out my name Better say I have Mary Well, you don't know How deep it goes Until it's getting you slowly It's all you got To let it go I got blood